introdurre Michela del Viva, l'Università di Firenze, il Dipartimento di Neurofarma, che ci presenterà questa ricerca tra, tra la biofisica, la psicofisica anzi, e high physics. Poi Michela è cominciata come un fisico, poi dopo è passata alla biofisica e ora passa a diciamo, parte del Dipartimento di Neuroscienze. Mi domanda come mai sono tutte queste cose qui, e però appena intervistata che Radio Moca, per cui se volete sapere tutto su Michela del Viva, ascoltate Radio Moca, molto pubblicità, <ride> sabato e domenica prossima. Prego. Bene, allora, eh, no, per tutti scusate, per se sei che sono in inglese, scusate se per... Se per fare le spalle di inglese. Ok, uh, I'm a decent scientist, but uh, I have a long standing collaboration with IMS physicists because I'm very fun, basically. So we talk a lot at home, at home. And, uh, and so uh, by this box, we, um, we came up with some idea and we noticed that there are uh, in these two different, apparently so distant fields, there are some commonalities, some analogies between the problems that are uh, faced by these two uh, different fields. And, uh, and the analogy is not superficial, it's very profound in the level of the algorithms that are used, and I will show you uh, this today. So, um, the brain. The brain faces a problem, which is to extract biologically relevant information from a large amount of input data in very quickly for survival purposes. We have to do this very quickly. And uh, because we have to initiate all the autonomic response like hormone releases, that is very slow. So the analysis, the visual analysis has to be very fast to keep up with this slowness of the autonomic system. So, how fast? There are data on, these are fMRI data on humans, that show that the response to briefly presented the natural scenes uh, recorded in several areas can be as fast as 20 milliseconds for D1, which is the primary visual area, is the first part of the cortex that is the brain that receives uh, uh, um, visual input. Okay, so as fast as 20 milliseconds. And then uh, there, there are lots of data, and that must be a strong compression. Because this compression, there are evidence of compression right in the retina. We know that we have about 100 million uh, photoreceptors between rods and cones, but we have fewer uh, ganglion cells that are the output of the retina. So there is a bottleneck, information bottleneck, right here at the beginning. And then we know that we have to talk of uh, 100 uh, billion neurons for all our functions, not only vision, vision, uh, motor, moving, etc., feeling, etc. So, we don't have enough neurons to analyze everything. Okay, this is the, the basic idea. Uh, I will do a brief uh, over, uh, uh, presentation of the visual uh, pathway. Okay, so the objects are uh, first are captured by the retina, which is in the eye. So from here on, start the, the information as another form it travels as a variation of membrane potential that can be transmitted from one neuron to the other. So it's an electric signal, okay? Traveling from the retina to the lateral geniculate nucleus to the primary visual cortex. Then information is received by the eyes process, so one filter, one visual field, is represented uh, contralaterally. Uh, and there is a precise organization of the retina, of the retina with uh, layers, and uh, uh, these are the nuclei of uh, cells in the retina. There are several layers of cells, 
they do a, a very complex computation and which we don't we don't know yet uh, everything about the computation done by the retina. We, we know something, let's say. This is the organization of the first synaptic uh, uh, Place, so which is the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus. It, also here we have a very precise organization in the area. So this uh, uh, architecture, very precise, is maintained also in the primary visual cortex. And uh, in the primary So if we take a slice of the visual cortex is organized in column, functional column. In each column there are neurons that are tuned to different orientations of the stimuli, as well as different uh, uh, wavelengths of the light, different direction of motion of moving, moving stimuli, etc. So there is this precise functional organization that corresponds to a precise We call this organization retinotopy. The, the animation doesn't work on this. I'm sorry. Uh, on this computer. Uh, this organization is, these are the columns selected for orientation. This has been measured by uh, electrophysiological experiments. Okay. Okay. In the brain, as far as we know, there are different representations of the visual stimulus as well. So we know that we have seen that the primary visual cortex analyzes every aspect of the visual stimulus: motion, color, orientation. While there are other areas that are more specialized for some uh, aspects of the stimulus. So there are areas specialized on uh, uh, motion, other on color, for, for example. And uh, uh, there are many visual areas in the brain, also in the frontal lobe for moving the eyes. Uh, in the macaque, we have estimated that there are more than 30 retinotopic visual areas, analyzing different aspects, so 30 different representations of the visual system. And uh, we know a little about that. This is a kind of a, a scheme of the architecture, how these areas are interconnected between them. And what we know is very little. We know that there is a separation between, very early from the retina, between uh, uh, moving, okay, moving stimuli and uh, uh, the percent, the um, reconstruction of forms and color. So there are two main pathways. One which is uh, ventral uh, pathway which is called the what. So in which there are presented the characteristics of the object that characterize the object. So color, form, for example. And there is also a more dorsal stream, which is the where pathway, that analyzes mostly motion and uh, perception of objects in them. So there is this segregation. Okay? So we don't know so much about this. Uh, okay. What we know from electrophysiology, from, from the 60s now, that the, we know the transfer function of neurons in the primary visual cortex, not all neurons, but some neurons. So there are neurons in the table, I don't know, non funziona il video, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, this video show the, the experiment that Hubel and Wiesel did with monkeys that were anesthetized and paralyzed. They were projected stimuli on the, on the board and, uh, and uh, they were simultaneously recording from a neuron, for example, in the cortex. And so by presenting the visual stimuli, they, the stimuli, they could, uh, they could see what, what uh, where that neuron was responding and how was responding to this input. So they found that uh, the, 
that neuron did not respond to the old field, but to a part of the visual field, which is called the receptive field of the neuron, with this one, for example. And they found also that the response is not uniform in the field. So they found that in some part, the neuron was responding by increasing the discharge rate, so the response. In other part, it was responding by decreasing the discharge rate. So this is the uh, response profile of this neuron, for example, that responds to a bar, an oriented bar, oriented vector. Then there were neurons that were responding to bars oriented slender, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, and so on, horizontal, and so on. And there are also neurons responding to edges, uh, contrast edges. So uh, these, new, these kind of response, uh, they were designed that it was con con constructed by the response of simpler units in the loop. Uh, Lateral genital and the thalamus that have uh, uh, circular reflective fields in this way, like putting together the, uh, the, the response of this neuron. Okay, so this is what we certainly know. And uh, let me go back to the data reduction that is uh, uh, necessary for the visual uh, system, for the brain in general. And uh, this idea is not new in the literature. And uh, uh, some authors, especially Marr, hypothesize that uh, the visual system operates very early uh, compression by creating a sketch, a simple sketch, by using some uh, salient, uh, some specific features like uh, uh, edges, lines, terminations, T junctions, something like that. And with this, they, we can uh, reconstruct uh, an object. So, and this we can, uh, we can experience every day with a simple sketch. We can grasp all the meaning of what, uh, uh, of what uh, in this case, uh, a painting means. And be, they can be edges, here for lines. Okay. So there is a, this, um, but the role of edges and lines in vision was taken from random, from random, in the sense that they hypothesized that we use these elements, but they didn't say why we use edges and lines. Huh? And this is what we, uh, I hope, I try to explain in this seminar. So, our vision is based on uh, the uh, perception of edges and lines. Also, the um, principle of economy in vision, so using few units to code all the visual stimuli, is not new. Uh, there are some uh, studies that uh, found that found, uh, they call these uh, kind of algorithms, efficient coding algorithms. And uh, with these algorithms, they reduce the redundancy that is present in the image. There is a lot of redundancy in natural and also in artificial images. And they do this by using principal component analysis, so which is not a local kind of computation, right? which is global all over the image. So one part of the image to do the principal component analysis, we have to put together information from all of the image. It takes a lot of wiring, it takes a lot of computation. Okay? So these uh, models, although they were succeed, they succeeded in um, extracting biologically recognizable receptive fields, huh? this is all computation, uh, although they are uh, very expensive computationally, not implementable because they use information from all the information. Okay? So we wanted also to um, circumvent this problem. No? So, and we started to 
uh, to see what happens in high energy physics. In high energy physics experiments, they have a uh, lot of data, especially at the, the LHC, a um, lot of data that are produced very fast, and then they, they cannot store all the, all the data, so they have to do Um, selection of events, yeah, of interesting events. The problem is to define what is interesting yeah, and record just this. Uh, they do this with the devices, I'm sorry for the, for the animation, it's all wrong. They use devices that are called trigger that select the events, a few events that are based on some uh, consideration. Um, they reduce the, the data in the input and they analyze all these data from their own. And this is just it's similar to the problem we have in vision. So, from the full information that they have in an event, they have to extract just uh, the particle tracks. Okay? Like we have to extract the edges and lines. So how similar are these two problems? So there are similarities at many, at many levels. First of all, uh, uh, there must be this strong data reduction. Both the natural and the artificial device have a limited number of elements to do this. Okay? Because the cost, the more elements, the, the larger the cost. Uh, then we have to limit energy consumption. The brain works in common. As well as when you build an artificial device, you have to limit, uh, for instance, uh, electrical power. And then the, the in vision, each neuron has a, has a maximum discharge rate. The frequency with which the um, signals flow. Through the, through the neurons from one to the other is limited. Okay? So there is a limitation. So there is a bandwidth limitation also for the brain as well as for the artificial device. So we said, okay, there are functional similarities, there are structural analogies because there are uh, also in, the, in this uh, electronic device. Uh, they are built with uh, a very precise architecture to uh, this case, in this case we have uh, in associative memories that are very precise and very ordered, like in the brain. I'll show you the organization of several areas. So, since we have similar problems and similar constraints, maybe we can find a common solution. And particularly, we wanted neuroscientists, as a neuroscientist, I wanted to learn something about uh, the brain. Uh, by the way physicists build this artificial system, since they know the solution, okay? So, uh, we, uh, what we exported is this uh, pattern matching technique that we use in triggers at the uh, CBF uh, and uh, the Terra Drum in Chicago. Uh, they have these detectors with this layer, this is a simplified uh, uh, sector of a uh, uh, detector, and these black things are the heats that are produced in an event that is much more complicated like this. So this is where the particles hit the, the, the detector. So what the, the system sees is this, uh, um, all these uh, uh, signals. They have to reconstruct the particle, the trajectory of the particle, and they, but the, com the combinatoric is very high because, uh, in principle, this could be a trajectory. Okay? Why this is noise? So all the combination of the of the signals in all the layers they call this pattern. So a pattern is a sequence of uh, uh, coordinates on each layer. So what that represents uh, a sequence of, uh, of its, uh, and uh, this sequence is written in an artificial device that has stored uh, 
uh, the right combination. So the device has stored the right combination. So when this system sees one of these combinations, recognize the combination as well. So the good combination has to, are stored in the electronic of the system. Okay? And so they match the configurations that are stored with the uh, different patterns. So can we, this is a, we wanted to export this because we think that this, this kind of a solution could be more general than the one they apply in this case. So we wanted to uh, use this pattern matching technique and generalize this technique to export the technique, the, the technique to measure the vision. Okay, let's see how we can generalize it. And this is where our pathway comes. So, uh, we, um, this is an abstract uh, uh, data reduction, uh, data filter, uh, that we can, uh, uh, we can say that it's a, uh, it's a funnel, so it has a bandwidth, so the input has to be reduced, the flux has to be, the data has to be reduced, and uh, here, in this part, uh, there is the pattern matching algorithm. So, we assume that this system has a, a limited memory. So, here it has a limited number of patterns with which to do the match. Okay? And also, there is this memory. These are the two assumptions. Okay? So, uh, this system matches the patterns, uh, all the data input, just with the set of patterns stored here. Okay? Throws away all the rest. So what goes through this flux of information is just what matches the pattern contained in here. Okay? This is very unusual to use this kind of technique in vision. This is a digital model. Huh? Uh, vision is an answer, it's not digital. Uh, so, while for uh, high energy physics it is known what are the patterns to put here, so the trajectory of the particles, in principle we don't know what are the right patterns of vision. Okay? We can ask that uh, they can be used to do the primal sketch. In, uh, in, pr in principle, we can assume that they are optimized. So, the question is uh, now, what is the optimal way to summarize information? And uh, uh, we use the, the maximum entropy principle. So, if P with I is the probability that uh, uh, some data uh, match uh, a specific pattern, uh, the information associated to each pattern that enters in that funnel is this one. Okay? So uh, the average information in the output is the sum of or the over the n pattern that are stored in the funnel. Okay? And this is the entropy of the system. So this one is the entropy of in here, output entropy, with a system that matches with n limited and patterns that are stored in there. So the best strategy is to choose the set of patterns because the set of patterns that we put in there is crucial. It's what defines what is summary, what is the summary. Okay? So the best strategy is to choose the set that maximizes the entropy. Okay? Uh, uh, if there are no constraints, uh, the maximum of the output entropy is to use all the possible patterns. But this is the figure. And it's not uh, compressing at all. Okay? So we have uh, constraints. One, we have a limited number of patterns with which to do the match. So there is, there is a limitation of the number of uh, patterns. And then there is a limitation on bandwidth. If we didn't have any limitation on bandwidth, 
it would be better to uh, the maximum of this is information, uh, the entropy as a function of log p. So the maximum of, uh, of entropy is, with, is for patterns with uh, higher uh, p, with uh, higher that provide higher uh, bandwidth. Why? If we impose only limitation of bandwidth, the maximum we obtain by using a large number of patterns. But we are both constrained, number of patterns and bandwidth. So the solution is in the middle. So by using both constraints, constraints of number of patterns to use and bandwidth, we obtain this this is the entropy. So the maximum, the patterns that fall under the maximum of entropy, these are the most efficient carrier of information according to our model. So we select the patterns that are that have intermediate, uh, they, are, they, they don't use too much bandwidth, and we want to use a few patterns. So this is a compromise between. Uh, in mathematical term, we, uh, we maximize this function and we stop, so we start taking patterns from here with uh, their frequency, and this is the frequency of the pattern. So we start taking pattern and we stop when we find uh, a limit on the bandwidth, on one side, or on the number of patterns. And these are the salient most efficient kind of information with the two constraints. This is a kind of um, the tax problem for informatics. When you have a sack, you go to steal something, and you have a limited sack, and you, and you want to steal uh, uh, as much as stuff as possible, but this stuff is, can be big, but as a cost, as a value. So you have to do a compromise, taking the stuff that is, uh, you have both constraints, size of the object, and this is a virtual uh, problem that has been solved in some cases, solved analytically. Uh, so what we do, and we use this algorithm to, and we apply to measure pressure, and see if it works. So first, we, we validate the algorithm for algebraic physics because there we know what is the right solution. We know what are the right patterns. So we did a Monte Carlo simulation of a, of a simplified uh, detector, and these are the random combination of tracks, and these are the real tracks. Okay. And as you can see, we can find uh, um, the right. Uh, figure of merit with the appropriate uh, uh, number of, uh, uh, in this case, tracks and bandwidth that correspond to the one used by the physicist in the experiment. So in this, in this, uh, this is interesting because uh, uh, it, this tells us that it's possible to find uh, the tracks in the detector without, uh, uh, for instance, if the detector is misaligned, so with the right combination is not so clear like this, huh? everything is misaligned. In this way, in principle, it could be possible to find the, the right uh, uh, set of tracks. So we apply this to vision. Okay? So let's define what are patterns for vision. So we use black and white image. Okay? The simplest case, I'll show you that. We use also uh, more uh, gray level or color image, it works as well. And we took the simplest, uh, 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 the smallest possible pattern, which is a 3 by 3 patch, of the 3 by 3 pixel patch. Okay? So we can have uh, white, uh, we can have this kind of patches, this kind of patches in black and white. And then they are uh, to, uh, 512 possible patterns. So we took a set of natural images from Genetesa, we used to black and white, so we digitized them, and we uh, counted the probability of occurrence of each pattern on the database. Okay? 
So this is the probability distribution of all possible patterns. Here, with high probability, we find black and white spots that are very common in a black and white image. And here we have, with low probability, we have these noisy patches that we can find here, for instance, in here, okay? So we apply our model. We, uh, we choose, in this case, 50 patterns with a bandwidth. Uh, we wanted to have 5% uh, of uh, total pattern in the app. So it's a very complex uh, solution, that we have, but we run also the model with other uh, parameters. And we extract the patterns under the maximum of the function, than this one. Okay? The, our model uh, assumed that we use just these patterns for the construction images in fast vision, we have fast vision, and we drop all the other patterns. So we select this. So we discard this, we discard this, we, dis we select just this for further processing. Now, if you look closely at these patterns, you can find uh, in approximation of the three by three black and white, you can find the uh, Edges of various orientation. Can you see that? Okay. So we found that the structure of the receptive field found in this physiology is the best solution from the point of view of maximizing formation of the most brains that the system could have. So that's why we have these receptive fields. That's why we are, that's why we are selecting to. Uh, edges and lines, because they are the best, the optimal carrier of information if the system is constrained and if it is maximizing information. Okay? Um, so, the model said that we use just these patterns to reconstruct uh, the black and white image. As, as you can see, we will not see this in the resolution here, but the resolution is very, very but uh, we can uh, uh, see uh, the structure that was present in the, uh, in the image from which they were extracted. And note that we use just 50 patterns, so the reduction in entropy is very high. So they, this is just 10% of total information that is here. Just 10%. Okay? And uh, in and this result uh, is driven just by the probability of occurrence of this process, because it's based on the energy, we don't feel, okay? Uh, so there is no a priori knowledge of what is inside. We didn't, we didn't use filters like uh, uh, tube with a shape uh, uh, of receptive fields. It's very, very general. So the, the edge detection looks like is dictated by the little reduction of information given the constraints. So this is nice, all oh, this is nice. And we, if we compare if we compare with other other models of vision, other models of vision they are either they don't reconstruct the features, the efficient coding uh, models they don't reconstruct very uh, precisely, and other models like a uh, uh, feature, uh, like local energy models, um, they, they reconstruct all the uh, contours, uh, but uh, they assume that the system uses edges and bar. So they use this as an assumption. We don't really use any assumption. Now, I am a, a, an experimental uh, guy, so I would like to, I like to uh, take direct evidence from the field system. So I want to measure if this is true, if this is nice, but I don't know if it's true. So I want to measure. How do I measure this? I measure this with the techniques that goes on a uh, big umbrella, which is psychophysics, which is the precise measurement of uh, human perception. So usually we measure the response of human subject as a function of a variable. As an example here, for instance, as a function of a contrast of the image. 
can be the velocity with which something moves. And we deserve to measure this by measuring the, uh, uh, in many trials, on a statistical basis, uh, what is the percentage of correct response that we know that uh, uh, we read the subject uh, uh, answer, for instance, with archery, some example. So it's a quantitative measure of perception, and if it's done properly, it's totally independent from the criteria of the subject. Because I ask you something, and you can you cannot use your criteria. It's a number, the criteria. The criteria, the sex, the temperature, if you, if you drink, yes. <laughs> but uh, I mean, your state, OK? Usually, we measure a psychometric, this one, which is the psychometric function, which is distinctive of a process. Psychometric functions are all very similar from one subject to the other. So uh, how did we measure this? So we did this experiment. So we take uh, patterns, like here, and we do this. We, this is a two-interval for choice experiment. There is a sound, this is time, the timeline, sound, we show then we show in the screen appears the stimulus, okay? And the subject has to say, was in the first or in the second interval? So it's forced to give uh, an answer. And uh, the uh, criterion, in this way, the criterion is not, uh, is not bad. And then we repeat over many trials this measure by, for instance, slowing the contrast. Here there is a stimulus. You can see this because it's very important, is below pressure. And we measure the visibility pressure of this stimulus. Okay? So what we did is we used all the patterns, and for many subjects, actually three, but we have many we, we do this experiment and we measure the visibility pressure for all the patterns as a function of their frequency of occurrence. Rare patterns. Then this is a red pattern, pattern selected by the algorithm of very common patterns. Okay, this is a, an example, but it won't work, so go. Okay, no, it doesn't work, so go. Because there is no. Uh, you have seen those, but you don't have, you have seen this. So these are the, the measurements. These are three subjects in different colors. Uh, this is the probability of occurrence of patterns. These are the response of this subject to patterns that have this probability. Okay. And uh, we, we uh, report here the inverse of threshold, which is the sensitivity. Okay. Uh, the higher the threshold, the lower the sensitivity. So, okay. as, I, as you can see, even though the, the subjects have a different level response, they all peak, the sensitivity is maximum for this range of, for these patterns that have this probability, that are the patterns predicted by the model. So it's the same kind of uh, so prediction, huh? so the same kind of uh, um, shape. Okay? Uh, so, um, this tells us that we are very sensitive to these patterns, but doesn't tell us if we use only these or other patterns. So we did an additional experiment, very, uh, very uh, uh, probing of the, of, the, of the algorithm. So we, here we want to simulate uh, fast vision. Okay? This, we are, uh, I mean, we, we are the, uh, Approximation of fast vision. So we present uh, stimuli very fast uh, for 20 milliseconds, for instance. And we present, we can present either sketches or as a control of the whole image, the original image, or sketches obtained by other means, by, by not using our model. Okay? And we do this by changing the sketches, we use oh, we have uh, many images, many sketches, we randomize them. Under control of that. Then we use a mask to uh, just to interrupt okay, uh, 
to avoid memorization, uh, visual memorization of what we have seen, uh, and to stop the flow uh, in some way. And then we ask the subject, uh, which one did you see? This one, this one, this is an example. Huh? Okay? This is the correct answer. Let me show this for a long time. So this is the basic experiment, uh, which is like this. Huh? This is very slow. Huh? So it's very easy. 20 milliseconds is very fast. And uh, although it's very fast, uh, we can have a uh, uh, response. Uh, very good response. Uh, we can go to 10 milliseconds, down to 10 milliseconds. And I'll show you here we have the percent of correct response of four subjects. In red is a percentage of correct response when we present this and then again this. So the control, we present the original, for example, butterfly, and then we ask, we, we have to discriminate okay, the butterfly from the which is almost 100%. This is our control. In green is the response when we present these sketches that are, uh, were obtained by using our model and by using 50 patterns, by imposing 50, 50 patterns and uh, um, a very large, a very uh, small metric. And, uh, and this is the response. It's, it's not a different, statistically different from the one we obtained with the full image. So, since we are able to discriminate this from another image in 20 milliseconds, it means that in 20 milliseconds we don't see this. We really see this. We see just pieces. Because if you sh I show you a reduced information image, you are able as well to do the task. Okay? Then we use the, the model with other, uh, with other uh, uh, obtained, uh, sketch obtained with other uh, uh, constraints, 16 optimal patterns. So the information contained here is 5% the information contained in the full image, and still you can see very well. Now, here we did a different selection of patterns for this sketch. So we start selecting patterns by the more, uh, more rare ones. And the, the number of patterns here provide the same amount of information as, the, as these 16 patterns. So the sketch here has the same amount of information of this sketch. What is different is that here we use the constraints of bandwidth and number of patterns, and here we don't use and the performance drops. Okay. So these constraints are very important, and uh, this is very. Uh, so it's uh, in fast vision. We see this is a confirmation that in fast vision we see just bits and silent patterns are those. This is done now uh, for ten milliseconds too, and they are still visible. So this is the. How much time do I have? Five minutes, ten minutes. Five minutes, ten minutes? Okay. Uh, color. Huh? Do, we, do we do color sketches? We use color in fast vision. So this uh, model that is very precise, this very precise uh, um, prediction can help us to understand this. So what we did is that we tried to do uh, the same kind of thing in color image. So first of all, uh, we digitize image. This is an example that with the um, original 24 bits to three, a three bit image. We use a, a space for the digitization which is very similar to the physiology, huh? and we obtain a digitized image. I hope it's here. Uh, sketch. We do this for all the image. We count all the patterns contained in this image as before. We obtain the distribution of all patterns. And we find that our optimal patterns are in this range. Why equilumina 
pattern that are what in uh, neuroscience we call real color patterns, because this pattern contains luminance, which is gray uh, level uh, uh, distribution, and also pure color equiluminal information. So what we see normally is a mixture of uh, gray shade and uh, color shade. Okay? When we talk about color in neuroscience, we talk about this, equiluminance. So here, the, all the, the part of the image have the same luminance. And equiluminant patterns are not in this range, are either in this range, very rare, like in equiluminant edges and lines, or they are uniform color of edges that are very common, so they don't fall in this range. Okay? So, um, equiluminant patterns are not efficient color information. So we did the, the uh, so in a, in a cost effect, in fast vision, a cost effect in the system uh, has to be, uh, has to eliminate color according to our prediction. So we did also here a um, psychophysical experiment. So we, uh, we used one bit of information, either luminance, this is in gray, dark and light gray, since the luminance system is more, um, is more um, strong for our perception than the colored system, we use not black and white, which is too strong, it's a saturation level. We use gray, dark and light gray. And also one bit of color. So we, uh, we obtain the, the, the black and white patterns and the black and white sketch, black and white gray sketch, gray level sketch, and also the with the same constraints, so in the same funnel, imposing the same compression and uh, uh, color pattern. And we do, if you don't see that, okay. Uh, uh, and also the color sketch. Then we measure, then we measure with the same technique, huh? the visibility of color sketches versus the visibility of luminance sketches with one bit. And as you can see, the, with the color sketches, we are at chance level. 50% into alternative for choice is chance level. So all subjects were not able to see this in 20 seconds. Okay? But they were able to see this as before. Okay? Then we said, okay, we cannot in reality, in real world, we got that. Lumina. We have color plus lumina, so gray shades and color shades. So what we did is we added the bit okay, by using uh, uh, four gray levels and so four luminance levels mm -hmm. and one color and one luminance level. So we have dark green, uh, light green, dark red, light red versus four uh, luminance levels. And you can see that by adding uh, one bit uh, of color to luminance, this is one bit of luminance, this is one bit of luminance plus one bit of color. It doesn't, performance doesn't increase. So by adding one bit of color, it doesn't change anything. So we don't, the idea is that we don't use uh, uh, color in this last vision because it's too expensive. So I'll go back, I'll go, I'll Skip on this and I'll go straight to, to the video that is experiment in black and white and so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. So, um, since uh, I am into physics techniques and the uh, vision system, uh, is it possible to use uh, the visual, uh, the way vision is implemented to, uh, in uh, high energy uh, physics device for data acquisition? Uh, because these two, I, I, I spoke about the similarities, but there are differences between the two. Okay? Uh, namely, uh, the, the First one, uh, vision is parallel and it's 
analog, the brain is analog, while all these devices are uh, digital. So, in the, they, this is not my field, it's my husband's field, he did this stuff, not me. So, what we, uh, they did is that they uh, tried to parallelize uh, the computation done by these uh, electronic devices and uh, used uh, an analog technique, uh, probably. Okay? And this is what we were thinking, which I'm the story from the 2000s. 2000. And uh, so they tried to, instead of doing this, uh, to uh, reconstruct direct tracks in a, in a digital way, they used analog uh, function like the receptive field I showed you, like the transfer function of the, the neural fields. Uh. So the response to a pattern is just not uh, uh, yes or no. But each cell it does a weighted sum of its uh, the time the vicinity, its uh, distance, and so uh, a valid track is not just a peak in this peak in this uh, representation, but it's a cluster. So there are some sets that respond more, some sets that respond less because they uh, it's it's an isolated thing. Okay. Um, and also they did strong parallelization of the, of the system and it, it's implemented in, uh, in this uh, device which is part of a project of INFN that they did some simulation and obtained good results with this kind of parallel and uh, uh, analog uh, system. So, and uh, at the, with this device, not that, uh, because uh, um, this data acquisition is very, very fast, okay? because they have a, a different scale of time. But you, if you see what is the, uh, the time used to process an event in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, high energy physics, and an image for vision, uh, they, they obtain with this uh, uh, technique um, a rate that is much faster than what we obtain in, in the past by using this kind of uh, algorithm that the brain uses. So that, yes, that, that maybe we can learn from an uh, artificial system how the brain works and vice versa. So probably for uh, algorithm that is a kind of uh, convergent evolution uh, that leads, that is very profound is at the level of the algorithm used, that can be uh, used in both fields and we can gain knowledge by uh, this interplay. Wonderful, you would have seen uh, what you showed because the, <laughs> the resolution of the project is more than the, oh, yeah. the animation didn't work. And uh, I, I was thinking that maybe a confirmation of what you presented is that uh, actually we are able to recognize uh, patterns in a hand, uh, sorry, in okay, black and white line comics. Sí. We do not feel that they are so different from, uh, say, colorful uh, images there. Essentially, you don't know. Yes. You don't know. Sometimes you don't know. Okay. So, questions, comments? Is there anybody? Okay. Maybe, maybe I am stumping, but what I understand is if if you actually use these simple patterns, why then we we see we so many, many more details indeed. Yeah, because you have more time. I mean, uh, when, you have a, uh, when you have a 20 milliseconds, the idea is that you grasp what is more informative, okay? In just a few bits, obviously. Then, uh, in your, the reality you have the time of your life to see things, okay? So you can concentrate and focus on that part of the image and 
then you have a smaller part, you can enlarge uh, the, the amount of details you can press at that point. Okay? Yeah. You have more time, so you can have more information. You can see covers. You can see yeah, covers. But, yeah, but what I don't understand is, uh, is, is this an interpolation process or just the fact that you concentrate on a smaller detail and then you absorb more information and then you use all the information? No, we didn't prove this. We didn't prove this. We, we did just the first step. We have to to verify that, which is in, in our... So then it, if your brain acquires only 5% of the information, then you cannot go back to the full information. Yes, you can. You acquire... No, no, no. A, I mean, you acquire 20 milliseconds, you have, and then you have a... I mean, the flow of information is going through. Huh? It's not stopped. You, you don't just... Um, this is the kind of... the same thing that does a trigger. So you, in principle, you use this huh, to extract the sketch for far, and to concentrate there for further information. But you don't, I mean, the rest of the information goes through and it takes more time, it takes other part and, other, and more neurons. This is just a part of the visual. We are modeling part of the visual system that is working, and this is new, this is done before like this, uh, that performs a uh, fast analysis that is necessary because there are many experiments that we can show that uh, in a uh, in few milliseconds uh, you, you can say if something is uh, dangerous for you, if a image is dangerous or not. Even though you don't, you don't know what you are seeing in something. They have done this okay. I'll show you. Okay, uh, the yes, yes, and then to the amygdala. There is a path directly to the amygdala part of the way it process emotions. This is the system you use for fight or flight. I mean, uh, you have to decide very quickly, you, you are in the forest, and you have to decide very quickly if it's a snake or it's just a twig, and, uh, and you, you keep going or you run. Okay? Probably, uh, and you most of this information comes from lateral vision, I mean, from rocks, for instance, in this is for this is for a central vision, okay. causal vision, because the, 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 all the experiment and all the images they have a very very um, uh, high resolution, so small small details. So this is for the uh, foveal. Uh, Sorry, vision. an important uh, so thing to explore maybe if this is also true for lateral vision, because I think that this is also more important to have a quick response. Uh, to patterns that are moving uh, not directly. In fact, the next thing is to do this with motion and use uh, larger, uh, larger patches. The problem with motion is that you add another component, so the number of uh, patterns increases exponentially with the size of the patch and the number of bits and dimension that you add. Uh, that we use a computer. We wanted to, we, we wanted to, to do a uh, uh, project with the MFN uh, 5 uh, group uh, to, to, do, to build uh, a device uh, that does the computation for motion. Because we, we, can, we are not able to do this with, uh, not just with that, but also if you use NETS, you, you have, must have very specialized uh, equipment to do this. Want to add something? I want to add something about the uh, moment that you animate. Uh, it's, uh, we can see much more videos. I think uh, for a physicist uh, to take this uh, the comparison with uh, the difference between trigger processing and offline processing. So to, all this is about uh, the trigger part to be able to pass with uh, very small information. Then there is also offline processing. The, the rest uh, of the system allows you to see all the fine details and takes more time and you can compare it. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So there are two things can be part uh, no, in the the In the national world, you have to the think point, that the point is that the, the, the information is in any case acquired. Yes. So you have you have it somewhere, but then you have time. You need, you need more time. You need more time. And think that uh, most of more, most of animals they don't see static things. Right? They see only moving things. Yes. So uh, we we can appreciate painting and staring, staring at stuff. But they don't. They just use motion and very quick, very fast vision. But also we, I think, that 
has a lot of tricks based on the fact that you can change part of the vision and yes. if they change the slow, you are yeah. considered another, another part that you don't see it. And we think that this, is, that this is faster than the, um, the way the, the, the timing of my movements. Our movements are slower, the saccades are slower than this. Okay? We think that this is the trigger for saccades. Because it's very primitive and very low in the visual stream. We are, we are going to do an experiment on eye movement to see if the eye movements are driven towards these salient patterns and areas uh, instead of others. So it comes before conclusions. And if I can add another question. <laughs> the, the, I appreciate the fact that uh, the, the trees doesn't feel like tree matrices because of the computational problems. Problem. But uh, do you have any clue of what is the minimum? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean is that related, this tree by tree is related to what the physiology of Yes, the yes, the experiment was the size. When I show you the experiment, the three by three, that I show you the experiment, is the size, uh, was done with the size of the receptive fields of the E1. Because we can, so since we have this orientation, we can use uh, is And we don't, you can't see any orientation. I and in addition, we do And for the grade levels, we did also work with four grade levels, but the results are very similar to this one. Okay. This is done with four grade levels, so two bits instead of one bit. You see the combinatoric is very it's high because you have two to the 18 possible different possible paths. So the system, these are the selection, but when uh, you are born. Okay? And the idea is that you start, uh, you have this configuration of patterns, but you learn to see this pattern. You start with everything and then you start with the selection process based on the frequency of occurrence, uh, the frequency of occurrence. Okay? So you have to narrow the space. Okay? With, four, uh, with two bits, so four gray levels, uh, these are the uh, this is the correct response for uh, uh, one bit, light gray, lighter green here. And these are all the responses with two bits with different choices of parameter. And the best you can do, you do with this configuration. But with this configuration, you have a, you have a very large bank. Okay? So there is not so much compression. Okay? And then there is also another thing. You have uh, 20 milliseconds, one action potential lasts 100 milliseconds. Given the noise, the Poisson noise, and uh, you, 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 in uh, 20 milliseconds, you have four, five action potentials. Okay? And with four action potentials, you have two bits more thoughts. So that's, that's why you have to digitize the image. So our system digitized, has to digitize because they have to transmit the information at low resolution. Because that's a few, just a few milliseconds. Okay. Mm. Well, uh, we have an experience here of a high bandwidth compression from this project. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you see this uh, on the screen, it's much better. You know? <laughs> no, you wouldn't understand. Okay, I think we can thank again. Uh,